Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted that you've decided to join us. As you probably know by now, we're studying the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this series of lessons is for the fourth quarter, that is the months of October, November, and December of 2013. It's a series entitled The Sanctuary. And today we're going to be talking about the sacrifices that are offered in that sanctuary, some of them, not all of them, there were many. This is lesson number three in the series for October 19 of 2013. There's a lot of material and a lot of texts and references and you might be interested in the handout that we use to help us in our discussion. It's available on our website at theox, that's T-H-E-O-X dot O-R-G. That's T-H-E-O-X dot O-R-G. And you'll also find there audio recordings and even video recordings of these sessions that we have together. I hope I've given you enough time now to get your Bible in hand because after we have our word of prayer, we're going to be into the scriptures. Let's pray together. Our loving Father, what a privilege it is to open your word once again with friends who care about you, who are interested in learning more about you, and may we, our discussion here together be a benefit not just to us, but to all those who are listening in and watching. Forgive us where we may have failed to understand you, and help us to take the largest possible view of the great controversy and the way in which you are about to win in that great controversy is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. As I mentioned, the purpose of this particular lesson is to understand some of the sacrifices that were required in the Old Testament and what they m might mean for our lives today. Uh, how many of you have offered an animal sacrifice? None of us have offered animal sacrifices. We don't do that now. Some of us have killed gophers and rabbits and things by accident or maybe even intentionally, but not as sacrifices. So what was all that animal sacrifice stuff? What was that all about? You know, there's a lot of it in the Old Testament, and God talks so much about it in Exodus and Leviticus and Numbers and all the details about how you do it. Um, is all that just for their time? Does that mean basically it's, it's a waste now that we're not, there's nothing more for us to learn from that? It's interesting to notice if you read in one of the more modern versions in places like um, Leviticus 1 and verse 2 and 10 and 14, it says when you offer sacrifices or if you offer sacrifices, that might suggest that Offering sacrifices wasn't God's first choice. We will notice in a few minutes that the first sacrifice didn't happen, of course, until after Adam and Eve were out of the garden. So clearly it was in the context of sin and not in the context of the Garden of Eden. There's something else very provocative to think about found in Numbers 15, starting with verse 27. Um, I don't know if you looked at these verses recently. Uh, hold on to your hats because these are some real thought provokers. If an individual sins unintentionally, he is to offer a one-year-old female goat as a sin offering. At the altar, the priest shall perform the ritual of purification to purify the person from his sin, and he will be forgiven. The same regulation applies to all who unintentionally commit a sin, whether they are native Israelites or resident foreigners. So it's nice to notice that God intended for everyone to be treated equally, whether you're an Israelite or whether you're a foreigner. What, but what, what, What's an unintentional sin? Well, let me read the next two verses and then ask your question. <laughs> but any person who sins deliberately, whether he is a native or a foreigner, is guilty of treating the Lord with contempt and he shall be put to death because he has rejected what the Lord had said and has deliberately broken one of his commands he is responsible for his own death and if you go on and read the next few verses you find out that there's a story about a young man who went out 
deliberately on Sabbath to pick up sticks because he wanted to make himself a little fire to, I guess, probably cook his uh, manna. And God says, put him to death. Stone him to death. So, um, well, I won't ask a show of hands how many of us have committed deliberate sins. Well, I'm not quite <laughs> sure. I'm not quite sure what you mean by deliberate. What does it mean, deliberate? Well, how do you use that word in that context? Well, I, I, what I would, my first response is look at Scripture. What else does Scripture say? And I know that in 1 John 3, 4, the most common verse we use to describe sin, it says, sin is rebelliousness or lawlessness. Uh, now, I know the King James says, sin is the transgression of the law, but that's a very free translation. It says literally, anomia is din, uh, I mean, hamartia is din anomia. Sin is lawlessness or rebelliousness. Now, rebelliousness sounds pretty intentional to me. Well, aren't we all sinners? Of course. That means we're all rebellious, right? Mm -hmm. and it well, just so some happens, of us might be unintentional sinners. Or degrees of rebellion. <laughs> degrees of rebellion? You bet. Well, I think if, what if a guy <coughs> was a bank robber? He robbed banks on purpose to get the money. And then he gets put in jail, and all of a sudden he hears about Christ, or this mm -hmm. turns his heart around. It's a good thing they didn't stone him right then, because it was deliberate. There you go. You still don't want to leave temptation before that type of a person if you ever let him out. <laughs> well, that might be true for people. Anybody who goes to heaven, too. That's, that's true. You don't. Okay. You don't. How do you <laughs> tell that you have done a non deliberate sin? Is it called non deliberate? Unintentional. Unintentional. Because if it's unintentional, you don't even know it. Right. So, how do you know? Do you just sacrifice a lamb now and then because you might have committed? Well, maybe this quotation from Ella White will help. Notice some important points about the sacrificial system. Now, if you happen to get our handout, there are five major points that we're going to really focus on here that I think are absolutely essential in, in trying to understand this issue. And this is found in um, Patriarchs and Prophets, page 68, first paragraph. And I quote, the sacrificial offerings were ordained by God to be to man a perpetual reminder and a penitential acknowledgement of his sin and a confession of his faith in the promised Redeemer. So, what was the purpose of the sacrifices? Uh, a reminder that you sinned. You know, that sort of goes with today. Yeah. Today's people don't like to say they do anything wrong. Yes. So it's to get us to say we have done something wrong. To admit. Going on, they were intended to impress upon the fallen race the solemn truth that it was sin that caused death. Do we believe every time we commit those little sins of ours, do we believe that those sins are deadly? No, we pass a law that says they're okay. We have peccadillos, we have little white lies, we have... If what are, are those things deadly? Misdemeanors and felonies, we have them all categorized. Well, it goes on. To Adam, the offering of the first sacrifice was a most painful ceremony. Now, did God intend for it to be painful? He knew it was going to be. His hand, this is Adam's hand, must be raised to take life which only God could give. It was the first time he had ever witnessed death. In fact, it was the first time the universe, as far as we know, had witnessed death. And he knew that had he been obedient to God, there would have been no death of man or beast. As he slew the innocent victim, he trembled at the thought that his sin must shed the blood of the spotless Lamb of God. This scene, scene gave him a deeper and more vivid sense of the greatness of his transgression, which nothing... I mean, what did Adam do? He, he, he said, okay, wife, I'll, I'll, I'll join you. I mean, how serious is that sin? 
this scene gave him a deeper and more vivid sense of the greatness of his transgression, which nothing but the death of God's dear son could expiate. And he marveled at the infinite goodness that would give such a ransom to save the guilty. A star of hope illumined the dark and terrible future and relieved it of its utter desolation. So it seems pretty clear to me that God's intention through all these sacrifices, and this is going to be repeated right through this lesson, God's intention in these sacrifices was to convince us that sin is deadly. Now, now there's, <laughs> there's a, do you think that that killing an animal convinces people that sin is deadly? I mean, I think right it, I now, think it, I mean, th during our time now, we never butcher anything. I mean, we get all our stuff from the store. Yeah, and it's nice little plastic bags and so forth. That's right. And I, but I, you know, I, I'm old enough to remember that um, my grandpa used to butcher things all the time. Yeah. Whether it was rabbits, whether it was chickens, whether it's yeah. nothing. You know, it was just like to him. It was like picking fruit off a tree. So well, if it's reasons. if it's like that, yeah. if it was like that then, just think what it was like back then when they really had to, you know, Let, let me tell you stuff. two things from my personal experience that I, that I know about. It is my understanding, and we have someone with a little bit of legal background here, it's my understanding that they do not allow butchers on juries. Hmm. Do you know if that's no, true? I've never heard of that. That's you need, to, you need to check it out. I'm pretty sure that's true. My second thing is this. We lived for many years in Africa. And during one period of time, we traveled about oh, maybe 12 miles from where we lived to the church, the Adventist church we went to. We didn't, we, we didn't always go to the same Adventist church, but during one period of time, we fairly often tra traveled that way. And my children were first, second, third grade age, and there about halfway to the church on Sabbath morning always, it seemed like, there was a big old, a guy had a big old cement round area with a pole and he would string up usually a goat by, the, by his back legs and whack his throat and it seemed like it always happened just about the time we drove past. <laughs> and <laughs> Never forget it. my children, you know, the way it affected them, the, the, you know, they would say, you know, and this was all in Swahili, so I, you know, I can't, I don't know exactly how it would come out in English, but, <laughs> you know, it was like, they would look at that and they would say, kill him, kill him, you know, that's the way it affected them. And, and, and just, you know, it just, you know, to me it was awful. Okay. Well, no, go ahead. Who were they wanting to kill? The goat? The goat. They, it, oh, they, I see. They were just, you know, they wanted to see the action. <laughs> see, we've become numb mm -hmm. to butchering and killing. Some of us have anyway. Yeah. But in, in Adam's time, at Adam's time, that was the very first one. Mm -hmm. He wasn't numb. And That's the, right. the, the sacrifices were... I think supposed to be relatively infrequent back yes, then. Absolutely. And to have deep meaning <coughs> that you know this causes sin causes death. Well, and, and it's very clear as you read the Old Testament that it came to a place where like so whenever you sort of felt like sinning you just had to pay a lamb and then you go on again. So that's a distortion of the desired Absolutely. Effect. So Adam had never seen blood. No. So then, later on, when we get this temple thing, mm -hmm. um, and they go through this process of cutting the animal's throat and so on and so forth, how many people a day did this? And well, and and I mean, and how long would it take? And I'm, and you know, and well, l l let me give you an example. Now, this is you're asking about the Old Testament, and you're asking about the sanctuary. I don't know. What I do know is this. There was someone who actually went to a Passover ceremony around about 40 or 50 AD. So this would be 10 to 20 years after Christ died and decided that they were going to estimate how many people actually came to the Passover. And they estimated 
<coughs> that it was somewhere around two million that came to the Passover a week long, a little over a week, eight or nine day ceremonies. And there were so many people wanting to offer sacrifices that they actually made a rule that 10 people would have to come together and bring one sacrifice because they, they just absolutely, there wasn't enough time or enough priests to kill all the animals. So, so is that what they did, you know, out in the wilderness? I mean, you know, there are well, estimates not. that there's thousands and thousands of people out there. And um, I'm sure it's not true. And and you know if if that I guess I'm I'm wondering that that takes me ultimately to the question of uh, just what is it that created the sin that I needed to come in and and kill a kill a lamb? How many? I mean, it's my well, understanding. My understanding of sin and our relationship to sin and what we are. You know, we'd be there every day. <laughs> We'd run out of lambs. We'd be bankrupt <laughs> in no time at all. Well, maybe you would finally get the idea that God intended for you to get that we ought to stop this stuff. Yeah, but come on. Yeah, but what? <laughs> come on. Come yeah. on now. On it isn't stop. happening. Stop the sinning. The sinning. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. All right. Sure. Yeah. I t uh, all right. I'll go there. Isn't there <laughs> a place in the Bible where God says your sacrifices make me sick? Yeah, we're going to look at it in just a few minutes. Okay. okay but what about another idea here? You're, How about you're, stopping sinning? What? You're, Come on, let's. <laughs> you're talking about these sacrifices as, as, looking at sin, that sin will actually kill you one of these days. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's how you're looking. What about the sacrifice as far as the blood goes, as far as the blood oath goes, from God? Well, what, you know, I'm talking about the time when he went before Abraham mm -hmm. and made those promises. Mm -hmm. Abraham, sa Abraham says, well, you're telling me all these things, but how am I going to really know this? And then he had him cut those animals yes. apart mm -hmm. and put them down there, and God went through and, and made And why did they all. do that? Why it, did they do that? To, I think it was to make the oath the most the it most, the highest level of an oath that you can get, that and that is, if if I break my oath, I you can kill me. Well, yes, we take that to be the meaning, but the truth is, that was the recognized way to make the most solemn oath in those days. That's what people That's did. That's right. That's right. And so, so God bent it, down to do it our way. Why does the blood, when they sprinkle the blood all over everything, mm -hmm. and there's blood all over the place? Mm -hmm. Why, doesn't, why couldn't that just remind people of that oath that God has made for everybody that, gave, that he gave to a Abraham? In our day, we believe God just has to tell you and you're going to stop sinning. But you haven't done it yet. Well, there is a promise <laughs> that it will happen. Isn't, isn't that yeah. correct? Can we back well, up? Yeah. Um, sin um, We're already running out of time kill. here. <laughs> Go ahead. Sin doesn't kill. It was Adam going against what God had said. Now, God, whatever God says, is like gravity in his universe, in mm -hmm. heaven. If you go against God's gravity, you're going to kill yourself. Mm -hmm. And so it wasn't, it was more Adam was going against what God's rules were, mm -hmm. which is like going against gravity. You want to mm -hmm. jump off a high hill, you're going to smash on the bottom. Mm -hmm. So God was educating us that you can't go against his... Um, or I'll uh, kill you. Well, no, you go I'm against not. my rules, I will kill these, you. These are natural <laughs> laws in heaven that if you violate them, you're going to smash and well, kill and, and, yourself. Okay, and, uh, and, and go to your, let, let's, let's look at that point. <laughs> How many times had anybody in the universe seen death up to that point? No one. As far as we know, nobody had ever seen death anywhere. So God says, if you sin, you're going to die. And everybody says, huh? The question is, is that a warning or a threat? Well, of course, that's the question. But, but I mean, if you don't even know what death is, what are we talking to about? Demonstrate it. Yeah. So we need to move on, because there's a lot of tough stuff to talk about. And notice particularly that Adam himself slew that first lamb. There's a lot of Christians who have other ideas. Many Christian scholars believe that the skin or skins from those 
from that or those sacrifices were used to clothe Adam and Eve. But if that is the case, how many skins were necessary? And skins, at least as we know them now, become dried out and very unusable as clothing in a very short period of time. A day or two, they're, they're, they're thick and they're hard and they're, they crack. So did God teach them how to cure skins? Or did he just make garments out of the wool? I mean, there's a lot of questions that haven't been answered in my mind. Some Christian scholars have suggested that the entire sacrificial system was just adopted from paganism and brought into the Jewish system because it was, it was what the people were familiar with, quote, unquote. This, of course, is completely contrary to what we just read from Mel and White. It could have been the other way around. It might have been a, yeah. somebody pushing something to distort the whole thing and it just spread all over the world. Okay. And then, and then it came back into the Jewish culture. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think the, it was in the end, familiarity breeds contempt. Yeah. At the time of Christ, it was nothing but a business and a, yeah. and a, and a money maker. It's very important to notice what Ellen White said immediately after the paragraph I just read to you. But the plan of redemption had yet a broader and deeper purpose than the salvation of man. Now, there are many people that believe that the plan of salvation has only one purpose and one purpose only, and that is to save man. Ellen White says, oh no, it has a broader and deeper purpose. So what is that? It was not for this alone that Christ came to the earth. Now, she's explaining why Adam had to kill the lamb. It was not merely that the inhabitants of this little world might regard the law of God as it should be regarded, do we need to take God's laws most, more seriously? But it was to vindicate the character of God before the universe. How does the killing of a lamb vindicate the character of God before the universe? To this result of his great sacrifice, its influence upon the intelligences of other worlds, as well as upon man, the Savior looked forward when just before his crucifixion he said, this is Jesus now commenting, Now is the judgment of this world, now shall the prince of this world be cast out, and I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all unto me. And notice see, she, she left out the word men, which is in the King James Version. It was, it's not supposed to be there. John 12, 31 and 32. The, so what does all mean? It means the entire universe. All intelligences. I will draw all. Well, look what she says next. The act of Christ in dying for the salvation of man will not only make heaven accessible to men, and of course women too, but before all the universe, it would justify God and his son in their dealing with the rebellion of Satan. It would establish the perpetuity of the law of God and would reveal the nature and results of sin. So are, are you saying the word men is is not in the original text. That's correct. The the King not James translators put the put word men in. in there. Yes. Well, that would keep women out, won't it? <laughs> no, no. <laughs> no, if you put men in there, I mean, if you leave it empty, it well, then you won't there. have. Yeah. yeah. Well, but it, hold on now. Let's let's there. let's get the point here. The point is God is saying. The and, and let's just think about this for a moment. Let's really think about this for a moment. I can guarantee you that the entire universe was watching as Adam killed that lamb. And what were they learning? Same thing Adam was learning. Mm -hmm. Sin leads to death. Sin leads to death. Not only leads to death, but it was going to lead to a price that God was going to have to pay because of the rebellion. Yeah, and then, and then in addition to that, well, go ahead. You go. Is it safe to say that the sacrifices were like a temporary covering and also like a foreshadow of what Jesus would have to do to yes. end all that? Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, but notice that's not all it says. It was supposed to teach us something about the character of God, about his government about the importance of his law. Wow. Immediately after speaking about Adam sacrificing that first lamb, why did Ellen White talk about the great controversy? Because they were connected. They are connected intimately. 
Isn't it clear that some very important lessons were supposed to be learned from that whole process? She was telling us not to take a microscopic view to back up and to see the whole plan that this was in. And to recognize, once again, I, I'm gonna, I have to say it many times, sin is deadly. Sin is deadly. Why is it deadly? Why is it deadly? The Bible says several things. The, the way the Bible portrays it is this. It says the only source of life is God. And Isaiah 59 verse 2 says, your sins separate you from your God. So it's deadly because it separates you from the source of life. Exactly. And it also causes collateral damage. Yeah, sure. Because it isn't necessarily the sinner that's going to die. Even Jesus died and he had never sinned. If, if, that, if that's really true, then why did Adam and Eve have to be removed from the tree of life? They sinned, and therefore that should have separated them from God, but it sounds like it was possible for them to, if, if they had been able to, even though they had sinned, mm -hmm. if they had been permitted to get back to that tree of life, they could have continued to live even though they hadn't Wouldn't sinned. Would the illustration have been shot? If well, I think I, mean, I think Paul I, I I think Paul takes care of that. He says in Romans fourteen twenty three, he says anything that does not come from faith is sin. That tree, the tree of life, represents an ongoing, continual, personal relationship to God. Sin is just the opposite. You can't have those two together. One takes you away from God, the other one takes you toward God. There's no way you can make them together. You know, it's uh, like Jesus said in the vineyard, you cut off a vine mm -hmm. and that vine dies. Mm -hmm. I mean, you cut yourself off from God. You may not know you're dead, but you're laying there all shriveled up. And what's interesting is when you do cut a vine off a grape, grape mm -hmm. vine, it immediately starts shriveling. Yeah. We're probably so shriveled we don't even know what. I think though that Adam being Adam and Eve being separated from the tree of life is separating from God. It was the illustration there that 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 happened that verified what's being taught for the rest of the time in the Bible yeah. here. Well, what what do most Christians believe? Well, let me put it this way. If you ask most Christians who is going to kill sinners in the end or going to torture sinners in the end, who, is, who do they believe does it? God. God's going to zap them. It's God. And what does this tell us? God's saying you're killing yourself. How many of us truly believe that sin leads to death? I ask the question again. How many Christians still believe that God slays or even tortures the wicked? What does it take to reveal the nature and results of sin? Ultimately, it took the death of Jesus. That was the point. That's right. We look at his life and we have, when we've looked at the whole thing and we've looked at it in detail and we've followed it step by step all the way through and we've focused especially on what happened in that last week, we are left with a choice. Do you choose to live the kind of life which he lived? That's his unselfish life trying to take care of and help others. Or do we choose death? Choose life or choose death? Choose sin, choose love. Choose selfishness, that's Satan's side. Or choose love, that's God's side. There are only two sides. Is that because when he lived life, he was living as he uh, had control, but when he put himself in control of a sinful world, mm -hmm. he died? Mm -hmm. So why did Jesus let man put him on the cross? Well, and we don't have the time to go through that whole process, but let me just point out, now this will be, I'm going to take something from the Bible and something from the writings of Ellen White for those who of you who are familiar with her writings. I hope many of you are. She says that in the Garden of Gethsemane, 
and the Bible Im Im hints at this, but it's not so clear in the Bible, that Christ fell dying to the ground. The universe saw in the Garden of Gethsemane that sin had killed Jesus. But God realized that if he had left Jesus dead in the garden, and let him die completely and dead in the, in the Garden of Eden, I mean the Garden of Gethsemane, we would have woken up the next morning, gone over there and said, oh, he's dead, he must have had a heart attack, or he must have had a stroke, or he must have had cancer, something we didn't know about. We would have had no clue why he died. So he had to go through that whole awful experience to convince us that there was another reason why he died, and we still didn't get it. Even when he, even when, and, and it wasn't until Paul came and tried to explain it, you know, what, what, 40 years later, that we started, we started to get the idea, you know, this wasn't just a death of beating or, or torturing or a crown of thorns or something, that he actually died of sin. It did look like it was a death of beating, torture, and it did. whatever. But yeah. he died quicker than a normal crucifixion would have. But, but, on, but on, in the garden, he had gone through that death experience, and nobody was touching. Sweating him. blood. Nobody had touched him. That, that whole his whole system was was broken yeah. down. But now we're talking about the sacrificial system, so we need to get back to yes. that. Yes, we're only so, on page one here. So <laughs> <laughs> that's what I'm worried about. <laughs> so here's the question: Does taking a lamb to the sanctuary and slitting its throat and watch that blood pour out and the lamb bleed away, does that undo your sin? No. 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 It doesn't undo your sin. Your sins are a permanent part of history and God's memory is not faulty in any way. He remembers those sins. We remember those sins. Satan remembers those sins. Jeremiah 31, 31 to 34, and Hebrews 10, 16 to 18, says God chooses not to remember our sins. So I'm not saying that this becomes constant fodder for God's thinking in heaven. He says, no, we're not gonna, we're not gonna waste our time thinking about it anymore, okay? But now, coming back, the idea of, point number three in our discussion, the idea of sacrifice suggests that we give up something that is precious to us. <clears throat> Isn't that what sacrifice means? But those first lambs that were sacrificed did not belong to Adam, and he had probably not had any special relationship with them in the past. So how could it have been a sacrifice for him? Or were those lambs maybe pets of the couple? We don't know. <clears throat> well. Something else, something to think about, well, yeah. Adam and Eve were to keep the whole garden, mm -hmm. everything. So this, this was part of their, what they were domain. in charge of. Domain is the word the Bible uses. These animals is part of their domain, yeah. were part of their domain. Mm -hmm. They were responsible. Yes. They were pets. And so to kill them, it was, it was something personal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, yeah, it was something personal. So four, the next point. It is very clear that Adam and Eve were significantly affected by taking the life or lives of those first animals, if you believe the writings of Ellen White. What are we supposed to learn from that? The entire universe was watching all of those events from the time of Eve's sin all the way through to the sacrifice of those first lambs. What do you suppose they were thinking as they watched that whole process? This yep. is ugly. Step by step. The sacrifice of the lambs did not make all those beings or God forget what had happened. No matter how costly sacrifices, do not undo past sins. Did it get them thinking about Satan, their friend in heaven, had what they, he had been whispering in their ear and maybe he was... I mean, I would start yeah. to think, what's going on now? So now what are you saying? Where are you going to on that? Well, if, all, if the sin doesn't really, I mean, if sacrifice doesn't do anything for your past sins, then why are we doing it? Exactly. Or why were they doing it? Exactly the question. 
What's the point of all the sacrifices? Now, there are two ways to look at this. And let's, at Christians and Jews all the way back, and pagans as well, have looked at one or the other of these two things. One is, okay, you need to offer it. You need to offer these sacrifices because you either did something wrong or you need to appease God somehow or other. In other words, you do this to take care of something that's happened in the past. You're going to take care of those past sins or you're going to take care of that problem that took place. That's one option. The sacrifice deals with your past. The other option is you offer this sacrifice and you say, God, this is awful. I don't want to ever have to do this again. And God says, that's exactly what I hope you were going to think. And do your very best not to ever do that again. And that's exactly what God intended. So is the sacrifices, were the sacrifices about past sins or were the sacrifices about future behavior? Yeah. That is the question. But what is it that changes the future behavior? If it isn't the sacrifice, then what is it? Well, isn't it, isn't it the your, promise? It's your response to the, okay. isn't it the promise to the horrid event. Okay, but look what happened. Let let let. I mean, let's think about what happened. By the time Solomon was dedicating his temple, they were slaying hundreds of thousands of animals. And what did it mean to them? Almost nothing. So it didn't affect their future behavior. They just thought they were paying off God. And God wanted us to improve and not just pay him, think we're paying him off. We can't pay God off. No. Well, they thought they were giving him an offering. And they were yeah. rich, so they were going to give him a big offering. Yeah. That was if, a big if thing. If I give you 10 lambs, then I can go out and sin again, and I'll give you 10 more lambs. Now, well, that, that, is a, that is a sin that's... Um, Intentional. Uh, intentional. Yeah. That is an intentional <laughs> sin right there. Exactly. That's what I think. I, we're getting the point here, I yeah. think. <laughs> well, what are we supposed to learn from the entire sanctuary system? In symbol, in figure, the sins of a human being were transferred to the lamb, which was then sacrificed. That human being had to cut the lamb's throat. It wasn't easy to do. I mean, you've got a big old thick woolly coat there and you're trying to cut the cut the lamb's throat and then its blood is sprinkled on the altar and in the tabernacle on the day of atonement and we'll talk more about this in the future on the day of atonement those sins were in figure again picked up by the high priest and carried into the most holy place and then after the high priest had met with God and those some ceremonies took place those sins were carried out and placed on the head of the scapegoat but, you know, during the Day of Atonement, there was something else very important happening. Mm -hmm. The people were repenting yeah. and, and trying to cleanse themselves. Yeah. And, and so that was part of the Day of Atonement. Yeah. You're supposed to look at your life and, and say, no, I'm not going to do all it, that. It was at the end of the year, and the idea was we're going to give up all that bad behavior, we're going to start fresh, or we're going to do it right this next year as far as possible. Yeah. And we'll talk about all that. We, that's not our focus on oh. this particular lesson. It's, that's a future lesson. Okay. So what would happen to that goat that was taken way off somewhere? What do you think would happen to it? Coyote's got it. Yeah. Coyote's got it, or the lion's got it, or something else like this. Or I suppose under really unusual circumstances, it could die of starvation out there, or maybe a thirst. Or whatever. Isn't really the big point, though, that it was led away from the camp, never yeah. to come again, back again? What, what, what would you do if you woke up the next morning and found the goat in your tent? <laughs> Is that what happens? Well, that would kind of break the <laughs> illustration, wouldn't it? Well, I'm just asking you. I want, I want you to know, I want to know, do you think that goat was really carrying all those sins? If he's really carrying all those sins, then you got a problem. You well, got really? Well, that's, that's so. What you're trying to point out here is this: it's symbology, is what it, it is. It better be symbolic. It better be symbolic, and and of course, if we believe that this is a this was a, a sandbox way of teaching the children of Israel that God has a plan. Maybe they didn't fully understand it, 
but God has a plan to get rid of your sins and take them far away from you, then that's wonderful. If this was such a successful system, how come we're not doing it today? Well, and that would be the next question or two that we need to talk about. And who said it was successful? Well, if it wasn't going to be sinning, if it wasn't going to be successful, why in the world did God give these 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 books worth of illust of, of instructions? In many and various ways, God has yeah. tried to keep mm -hmm. teach his kids down to the eons. Tell us that no. sin is deadly. Okay, in light of all the above, this is the fifth point that I want to make. In light of all the above, it seems clear that the one purpose of these sacrifices was to convince people to stop sinning. Have I said that before? Mm -hmm. hmm. There is no sacrifice that can undo past sins. The only purpose of the sacrifices was to teach us something important about the deadliness of sin. And what does the Bible say about the deadliness of sin? May I re re comment or look at three key verses. Remember Genesis 2, the very beginning? You know, and I really need to start with verse 15. Then the Lord God placed the man in the Garden of Eden to cultivate it and guard it. He said to him, You may eat the fruit of any tree in the garden except the tree that gives knowledge of what is good and what is bad. You must not eat the fruit of that tree, which would be sin. If you do, you will die the same day. Okay? When I stop sinning, is that supposed to be my, my intentional sins or my unintentional sins? Well, I'm supposed to stop my unintentional sins? You, you better stop every sin that you have a chance to stop. I have a question. <laughs> unintentional sins, the pretty hard to stop. tree in the garden, there was the fruit of good and evil, mm -hmm. and he didn't want Adam to eat of that tree. Is that because he didn't want Adam to know evil? Exactly. That Adam only knew good, yes. and he says, don't go there, don't go. Yeah. And Adam and Eve decided to go and taste evil? Basically, yeah. Let me read two more verses. Isaiah 59, 2, we mentioned it before. It is because of your sins that he, that's talking about God, doesn't hear you. It is your sins that separate you from God when you try to worship him. And the verse that's most familiar to, I hope all of us at this table and many Seventh-day Adventists, of course, is Romans 6, 23. For sin pays its wage death. But God's free gift is eternal life and union with Christ Jesus our Lord. Now God has another plan, but if we don't take advantage of the other plan, sin pays its wage. God doesn't do it. Sin pays its wage. And what's that wage? Death. Death. Well, in the garden, the devil handed Eve the apple of bad mm -hmm. because he's the king of death. Mm -hmm. And he wants more people in his kingdom. Sure. You asked earlier about how God felt about this. Um, let me just look at a couple of places. Uh, there's a lot of passages in the, in the major prophets and the minor prophets, but look especially at Isaiah 1, uh, verses 10 to 20. This is Isaiah's first sermon. Imagine the young pastor starting out his first sermon, Jerusalem, your rulers and your people are like those of Sodom and Gomorrah. Listen to what the Lord is saying. Pay attention to what our God is teaching you. And he, and, and he drops down. I don't have time to read the whole thing. Um, it's useless, verse 13, to bring your offerings. I'm disgusted with the smell of, your, uh, of the incense you burn. I cannot stand your new moon festivals, your Sabbaths, and your religious gatherings. They are all corrupted by your sins. I hate your new moon festivals and holy days. They are a burden that I'm tired of bearing. Is God making his point here? I Wonder. Is that like the Laodicea church? I feel like vomiting you out. Is that something similar? Very much like that. And one other very, fam very familiar verse. This is Micah 6, 6 to 8. What shall I bring to the Lord, the God of heaven? Now we're talking about sacrifices. When I come to worship him, shall I bring the best calves to burn as offerings to him? Will the Lord be pleased if I bring him thousands of sheep and endless streams of olive oil? Shall I offer him my firstborn child to pay for my sins? No, the Lord has told us what is good. What he requires of us is this, to do what is just, and the other word for just is righteous, the right thing, to show constant love and to live in humble fellowship with our God. That's where we need to be going. 
So we are supposed to avoid sinning and to be live right, show love, and be humble. Yes. And why does God ask those things? Because he's hoping some of us are going to be able to go back to heaven and live for the rest of eternity without starting the whole rebellion all over again. He wants us to be like our father. Yes. Well, let's talk about the story of Abraham. That's a very famous one. And, and the time he offered his, his son, what, a, what an experience that was. Genesis 22. Ellen White has some very interesting words to say about that. It was to impress Abraham's mind with the reality of the gospel, as well as to test his faith that God commanded him to slay his son. The agony which he endured during the dark days of that fearful trial was permitted that he might understand from his own experience something of the greatness of the sacrifice made by the infinite God for man's redemption. No other test could have caused Abraham such torture of soul as did the offering of his son. God gave his son to a death of agony and shame. Patriarchs and Prophets 154. Wasn't Abraham's sacrifice of his son a way to demonstrate the seriousness of sin? That's my question. Well, Ellen White goes on, she says, The sacrifice required of Abraham was not alone for his own good, nor solely for the benefit of succeeding generations. That would be us. But it was also for the instruction of the sinless intelligences of heaven and of other worlds. Boy, she seems to go to that universe-wide kind of approach real often, doesn't she? Is that the word all in yes, the Bible? Yes, exactly. From John 12. John 12. The field of the controversy between Christ and Satan, the field on which the plan of redemption was wrought out, is the lesson book of the universe. Because Adam had shown a lack of faith in God's promises. When did he do that? When did Adam show a lack of... Abraham. Abraham. I'm sorry. When Abraham showed a lack of faith in God's promises, when was that? Several times. When he lied about his wife, especially, huh? And when he took Hagar yeah. as his. Yeah. Satan had accused him, I'm reading on, Satan had accused him before the angels and before God of having failed to comply with the conditions of the covenant and as unworthy <coughs> of its blessings. So what happens when we sin down here? What does Satan say? We're not God's children. Ah, look at these people you claim to be your children, God. Don't, they don't deserve to be saved. They're a bunch of rebels. They're just as bad as I am. They're right? mine. <clears throat> They're mine. So is that not true? It is true. Unless we choose to do what? Cling to the cross. Change our ways. God desired to prove, I'm reading on, God desired to prove the loyalty of his servant before all heaven to demonstrate that nothing less than perfect obedience can be accepted and to open more fully before them the plan of salvation. Patriarchs and Prophets 154, paragraph 3. Heavenly beings were witnesses of this scene as the faith of Abraham and the submission of Isaac were tested. The trial was far more severe than that which had been brought upon Adam. Compliance with the prohibition laid upon our first parents involved no suffering, but the command to Abraham demanded the most agonizing sacrifice. All heaven beheld with wonder and admiration Abraham's unfaltering obedience. So, Gordon, is an unintentional sin, is that still being perfect? <laughs> uh, you know, I... It, no. <laughs> I don't really like that angle she's going with on this. Well, the question isn't whether you like it. The question no, is, is it no, the truth? No, no, no. I think another one is what the Bible says. When, when, <laughs> when um, God told Abraham, I know now that you will not withhold anything from me. Yes. It's, it's not so much obedience. It's that he will not withhold anything from him. So but to me, there's a little difference there. I mean, it's well, similar, there's no doubt about it, but, but I think that, that looking at it just on the obedient side is just, 
how far can you go with your obedience well, until... Well, what, and what, what was Abraham thinking up until the point when God stopped his hand? What was he thinking? He was thinking, God, I will do this. As hard as it is, I will do this. That's obedience. Because you will raise him from the dead. Yeah, I and mean, that's what he, that was his conclusion. But Remember... The Bible says mm -hmm. that God said to him that you will not, he knows now that you will not withhold anything yeah. from me. And well, that's, that's the point for everybody. Yeah. I mean, how many times does, has this happened to anybody else? I don't think anybody except yeah. for, for Jesus. And I'm glad it hasn't because that's really a bad thing. I mean, it's a bad, yeah. uh, a bad well, event so right how, there. How is that different than perfect obedience? How is not withholding, <laughs> how is not withholding anything? How is that not because, perfect obedience? Because the devil can want obedience too. Well, let me if read the rest of the it, statement. If you just look well, at it that we're, way, we're understanding the devil that wants not, you to obey it's not, him. It's not just obedience, it's obedience to God. That's understood. Well, I, I think that if, you're, if the point is there, I, you just will not withhold anything from me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, but well, all heaven beheld with wonder and admiration Abraham's unfaltering obedience. All heaven applauded his faithfulness, his fidelity. Satan's accusation were sh accusations were shown to be false. What is happening here? What's going on here? Satan's accusations were shown to be false. We are learning who is telling us the truth in the great controversy. Is God telling us the truth, or is Satan telling us the truth? God is demonstrating, God is teaching. God declared to his servant, now I know, and here we come to Gary's statement, now I know that thou fearest God, notwithstanding Satan's charges, seeing thou hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, from me. God's covenant, his agreement, confirmed to Abraham by an oath, before the intelligences of other worlds testified that obedience will be rewarded. It has been difficult, it had been difficult, even for the angels to grasp the mystery of redemption, to comprehend that the commander of heaven, the Son of God, must die for guilty man. What, is he, what did they need to learn? What did Abraham learn? What did the universe learn? Who is telling us the truth about sin and its results? It was hard for the angels to grasp that. They still weren't sure whether they should believe Satan, whether they should believe God. Well, obviously, Abraham believed God. Yes, and that and but through the experience like of Abraham, God was able to demonstrate something. It he, looks like the demonstration was, to me was Abraham did not withhold anything from God which was an illustration from God not withholding his son from for sure, us. Sure. It's just, that's what the illustration is kind of leading to for me anyway. Yeah. So. Oh, but what we have here, basically, is a mini version of the story of Job. Mm -hmm. God said, Job is faithful and upright. Satan said, there's nobody down on that earth that's faithful and upright. I can make any one of them sin. And God says, no. My judgment is that Job will be faithful. And so Satan says, let me at him. And we know the story. And when it got all done, what did God say? Job, you have said of me of what, of what is right. You know, there was Job, mm -hmm. and then Abraham was tested and proved to be loyal to God. In the future, there's going to be a whole group, the 144,000. Right. They're going to have the same Job experience. Job-like experiences. It had been difficult even for the angels to grasp the mystery of redemption, to comprehend that the commander of heaven, the Son of God, must die for a guilty man. When the command was given to Abraham to offer up his son, the interest of all heavenly beings was enlisted. How many of, were, how many of them were watching? All of them. With intense earnestness, they watched each step in the fulfillment of this command. When to Isaac's question, where is the lamb for a burnt offering? Abraham made answer, God will provide himself a lamb. 
And when the father's hand was stayed as he was about to slay his son, and the ram which God had provided was offered in the place of Isaac, then light was shed upon the mystery of redemption, and even the angels understood more clearly the wonderful provision that God had made for man's salvation. Do you think the angels were saying, God, let those humans go. Let them just disintegrate. And God says, no, you have to learn I'm a God of love. Mm -hmm. I will pay what is the price for them so that they can enter heaven. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, we would have just been evaporated, vanished. Our adult Bible study guide wants us to point out two essential principles from this lesson. First, no one but God himself can bring the true sacrifice and the means of salvation. It is the Lord who will, who must provide. My response to that is, yes, I agree with that. Only God can answer the questions about whether he's telling the truth or whether Satan's telling the truth. Abraham eternalizes this principle by naming the place Yahweh Jireh, which means the Lord will provide. Second, the actual sacrifice is substitutional, one that saves Isaac's life. The ram is offered in the place of, in the place of Isaac. That animal which God provided prefigures the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ on whom the Lord has laid the iniquity of us all. And that, of course, is Psalm 53 and Acts 8, verse 32. Does this suggest that somehow God's offering of his son does something about our sins after they have been committed? Or is he trying to convince us that we need to stop sinning? Now we've talked about this before. If God, if somehow or other, the death of Christ is some kind of magic cover that just takes care of all past sins, no matter how they were committed or when or whether they're guilty or not, then everybody should be saved. Well, we're running out of time. I hope you've enjoyed our discussion. Um, look carefully at the rest of that chapter on Abraham's sacrifice and patriarchs and prophets. Abraham went through a great deal of anguish during that time. And I think God intends for us to suffer a little bit to realize how serious sin is. You think about it. See you next week.